An Introduction to Early Modern History, Part 2, The Global Early Modern. From the first part of this lecture, you should have some broad sense of the major historical events and transformations that bookend the early modern. That is to say, the events and transformations that have prompted historians to identify first a new period that was different to the medieval and second, the ending of that period as it gave way to something more clearly and decisively modern. Now, in this second part of our lecture, I would like us to focus on one single year during our time period. A 12-month stretch from right slap in the middle of the early modern period that we've just sketched out. That year is 1642. We'll focus mainly here on places outside of Europe, partly because we've already spent so much time talking about the British Isles and Europe in that first part of the lecture. Let's talk about Europe briefly first, though. 1642 was, as many of you will know, 24 years into the Thirty Years' War in the heart of the European continent. Our year also saw some of the first fighting in the English Civil Wars at the Battle of Edge Hill. In many ways, the Thirty Years' War can be seen in part as a consequence of conflict sparked by the Protestant Reformation of the previous century, pitting Catholic Spain against the Protestant powers of Northern Europe. Although the involvement of Catholic France on the side of the Protestants also indicates that this conflict was more complex than just that. It was also about the power politics of rival European dynasties. The English Civil War is usually associated with that struggle that we mentioned in part one between the rights of kings and the rights of parliaments. But again, it's worth remembering that the English conflict was also more complex than that, a consequence in part of the Reformation about whether the type of Protestantism practised in England would be the Puritan version favoured by Cromwell or the Anglican version favoured by the Royalists. But let's leave Europe behind, at least for now, and look at the year 1642 in other parts of the early modern world. Let's start in the main centre of world civilization in this period, which is to say, in China. The Chinese Empire was by far the most populous and prosperous place on the face of the planet in 1642. At this time, China and India together accounted for more than half of the world economy. So, what was going on in China in 1642? The short answer to that is a bloody conflict and a change of regime far more dramatic and costly in human life than either the Thirty Years' War or the English Revolution. The Ming Dynasty, in power since the 14th century, was fighting a losing struggle to cling on to power. Facing the twin challenges of a peasant uprising inside its borders and an invasion of Manchu armies from the north. Within two years, the last Ming emperor would be dead. A Manchu army occupied Beijing and a new emperor, the first of the Qing dynasty, installed. It's worth us taking a brief moment to talk about the wealth and power of imperial China in this period that we are calling early modern. More than two centuries before 1642, during the early 15th century, Ming China sent out exploratory naval expeditions under Admiral Zheng He. These were massive and expensive ventures. The Chinese fleet consisted of more than 300 ships. Columbus left for the New World later in the same century with three ships. All of them were much smaller than Zheng He's flagship. Zheng He's fleet sailed with more than 25,000 crewmen and soldiers. Columbus went to America with fewer than 100. The Chinese expeditions could have rounded Africa and established direct trade with Europe, if that had been their intention. But instead, they stopped altogether in the 1430s, as China entered a long era of isolation. Why? One crucial reason is that China did not need to find external trading partners, as its rulers believed that it was rich enough. Emperors prioritised the maintenance of order at home above distant adventures. 
Indeed, a century and a half after 1642, the British envoy George McCartney led a delegation to the court of the fifth emperor of the Qing dynasty with the aim of opening up trade and diplomatic relations between Britain and China. In 1793, McCartney was sent packing, not because the Chinese felt threatened by the British. They could not foresee the opium wars that the British would later wage against them in the 19th century. Rather, because they did not need anything that the British had to sell. The emperor put it like this. Our celestial empire possesses all things in prolific abundance and lacks no product within its borders. There is therefore no need to import the manufactures of outside barbarians in exchange for our own produce. Let's get back to our year of 1642. What about the second most populous and important global civilization in 1642? Well, in India, this was not the same kind of era of political instability and transition as it was in Europe and China. In India, there had been an important period of transition earlier, during the 16th century. In the 1520s, the Mughal emperor Babur invaded the Indian subcontinent from Kabul in the north, setting up his court at Agra, which is some 140 miles from the modern Indian capital at Delhi. This marked the beginning of the Mughal Empire in India, which ruled all the subcontinent until the middle of the 18th century. Eventually, the Mughals would be supplanted by the British East India Company, but in 1642, that was long in the future, unimagined and unimaginable. Europeans traded with Indians, but offered no political threat. They were just one subgroup of merchants in bustling port cities like Mumbai, Kolkata, Kochi or Chennai. In any case, the main seat of power was far from the coast. At Agra in 1642, the most noticeable thing to any visitor was the nearly completed Taj Mahal. This period has since been called the Golden Age of Mughal architecture and the Taj Mahal, commissioned by the fifth Mughal emperor Shah Jahan, its crowning glory. Let's move away now from that newly constructed wonder of the modern world to another place where a lot of building was going on, albeit for very different reasons. In 1642, in the English colony of Barbados, the English colonists were busy ordering their Irish indentured workers and African slaves to build sugar works. This was part of a sugar revolution that soon spread to other parts of the English and French colonised Caribbean, most notably to Jamaica and Saint-Domingue. Those two colonies, Jamaica and Saint-Domingue, became the most valuable European colonies in the world during the 18th century, thanks to their plantation economies based on sugar and slavery. All of that was just getting underway in Barbados in 1642. Englishmen in Barbados were learning techniques from the Portuguese and Dutch who had begun to make huge profits from their own New World plantations. A crucial ingredient here was cheap labour. European planters were becoming increasingly reliant on a rapidly growing transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans, which would soon supply practically all their plantation workers. There are two things worth noting here. First, in the early modern period, between around 1500 and 1800, enslaved Africans were the single largest group of transatlantic migrants. Nearly four times as many Africans as Europeans crossed the Atlantic as migrants before the 19th century. In other words, forced African migration into the Americas was far bigger than free European migration. After 1642, about half a million enslaved people were transported from Africa into Barbados. More than two million enslaved Africans were forced to board merchant ships bound for British Jamaica and French Saint-Domingue, part of the biggest forced migration in history. The second thing to note is that such large-scale migration did not lead to the sort of population boom in the Caribbean that you might expect. Despite all that inward migration, 
the combined population of Jamaica and Sandemang stood at less than one million at the beginning of the 19th century. This was because slavery was a deadly business. Deaths outnumbered births, and European slaveholders relied on the slave trade to replace the enslaved people whom they'd worked to death on their plantations. Forced migrants arrived en masse, but the overall population only grew slowly. So, we have now visited China, India and the Caribbean in this second part of our lecture. Now I want to tell you the story of what happened across two days towards the end of our sample early modern year of 1642, on the opposite side of the world to where I am now talking to you from Southampton. On the 18th of December 1642, the people of the Ngati Tamata Kokiri looked from the campfires on their coast out to sea. There they saw what must have looked to them like two large war canoes floating in their bay and close to the shore. To assess this weird turn of events, the Ngati Tomata launched two of their own canoes and went out to meet the newcomers. Who could they be? What did they want? Invaders often came from the northern island of Oteria, but not vessels like these. In any case, drawing closer across the water, the Ngati Tomata were able to see that the unannounced intruders looked unlike any North Island Maori that they had ever seen. They tried to talk with them. The newcomer sounded strange and understood nothing. A horn was blown, answered by a similar instrument from the intruder's vessel, but more meaningful communication was impossible. The Ungati Tomata took to their oars and left the scene. The morning of the next day, the intruders remained in the bay. A group of 13 Ngati Tamata rode out to them. As they neared, the strangers held up cloth and other items. The group of 13 left in their canoe, and soon after, seven new boats launched out from the shore across the bay towards the strangers. These of a different type, war canoes. The intruders had lowered a small boat full of men into the water, trying to get from one of their large ships to the other. The Ungati Tamata seized the opportunity and bore down fast upon it, killing three of the occupants and mortally wounding a fourth. It was enough. Soon after, the breeze bulged out the huge canvas sheets hanging from the tall masts on the intruder's two ships. The Ungati Tamata pursued in 22 war canoes as the interlopers fled the bay, all the while firing back on the advancing canoes with noisy weapons that were effective enough to deter the Maori from cutting off their escape. Out in the open sea, the two European ships disappeared over the horizon. More than a century would pass after 1642 before any more Pakea, a Maori word for Europeans, came back to bother the Ungati Tamata or any other Maori group in New Zealand. As one New Zealand historian jokingly puts it, this one brief moment of deadly violence against a group of Dutch sailors may have been the cheapest and most effective resistance to European expansion in all history. Why does this episode belong here, at the end of my lecture, introducing early modern history? For two reasons, I think. The first is that here is another illustration of a theme central to understanding the early modern period in the context of world history, that is to say, European exploration and colonisation. The Maori encounter I have just described was with two ships of the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman, as he explored the coastline of what came to be known as New Zealand in 1642. Tasman was the first European to do this. Tasman set off from Batavia, in the Dutch East Indies, commissioned by Governor Antonio van Diemen to explore lands to the south. By the time he reached New Zealand, Tasman had missed Australia, but discovered a smaller, inhabited island to its south, first named van Diemen's Land, but later renamed Tasmania 
in Tasman's honour. When his expedition arrived in New Zealand, it sought out a safe bay from which to go ashore. The Dutch observed the Maori campfires from their two ships, then followed, as we have seen, a short and deadly clash. Tasman sailed out of what he later called Murderer's Bay, declaring that no friendship could be made with these people. Tasman's voyage highlights the connections between exploration and colonisation. Even if colonisation did not always occur immediately after European encounters with unfamiliar places and people, there nonetheless was often a connection. Eventually, practically all of the Aboriginal inhabitants of Tasmania were killed as a consequence of later European settlement of the island by the British. But Tasman's encounter with the Ngati Tamata Maori adds to the examples of China and India to underline the point that during the period before 1800, Europeans were not all powerful. They could often be ignored, denied access, or even frightened away. For the millions of Amerindians who died of European diseases in the aftermath of Columbus's arrival, or for the hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans forced across the Atlantic to work on the plantations of Barbados, Jamaica or Saint-Domingue, the consequences were terrible. But by contrast, for many people in Imperial China, Mughal India or Maori New Zealand, for much of the early modern period, direct contact with Europeans could be minimal. And when it did happen, they were sometimes able to call the shots. The second reason for ending the lecture with this New Zealand story is that it helps to highlight some of the limitations of the label early modern and indeed of any other labels that we're using for periods on this module. Our four main time periods, ancient, medieval, early modern and modern, are all inherited labels and they are all contestable concepts. They can make some sense especially when applied to the histories of Europe. But they are often a bit harder to understand when looked at from other parts of the world. The example of the New Zealand Maori in 1642 makes clear that there are parts of the world for which the label early modern makes little or no sense. All my attempts in the first part of this lecture to tell you a set of stories about the start of an early modern period mean relatively little from the perspective of Maori looking out to sea in 1642. They had their own complex history and ways of organising stories about their past. People probably first arrived in New Zealand during the mid-14th century of the Common Era. In other words, the story of Maori New Zealand dates to sometime around the time of the Black Death in Eurasia. The group that first settled travelled more than 3,000 miles and were one branch of a much bigger Polynesian group whose voyages spread their cultures far and wide throughout the region. They were among the most sophisticated maritime navigators of their time. To put it crudely, better than Vikings at navigating by sun and stars and performing navigational feats every bit as impressive as those of Christopher Columbus, Cheng He or Abel Tasman. They have a history passed down through generations and traceable in archaeology, but nothing that fits in any easy way into our manufactured boxes labelled ancient, medieval and early modern. So, is the term early modern only useful for talking about European history? Certainly it is a term first coined by European historians to talk about Europe. In China, many historians divide the past according to imperial dynasties. So, the episode we looked at a moment ago, the mid-17th century end of the Ming and the rise of the Qing dynasties, though it falls right in the middle of our early modern period, can mark an important chronological line of division for many historians of China. Despite that, some historians of China do find the term early modern useful. One reason for that is that it helps to shift attention away from the political changes at the top of society, the stories of dynasties and their rulers, and to focus instead on broader transformations, including social and cultural change. Another reason is that it can also help to underline 
that China transformed in this period before it was forced to open up to European trade and influence during the 19th century. In other words, that China was modernising and modern long before the intrusion of Europeans. Similarly, in Indian history, focusing on an early modern period underlines the fact that Mughal India underwent the same types of modern transformation, say in literacy, government or economy, that we talked about in the first part of this lecture, long before it was conquered by the British East India Company. It is remarkable that many of the transformations that historians have taken to characterise a shift from medieval to early modern in Europe were repeated elsewhere. Growing political and cultural centralisation, for example, rising literacy and the increasing range and intensity of trade, all of these things were paralleled across much of old world Eurasia in the period between 1500 and 1800. One historian, Geoffrey Parker, points to another shared experience around the early modern globe, what he calls a 17th century crisis linked to climate change. In Parker's global vision, the Chinese dynastic crisis, the Thirty Years' War and the English Revolution can all be combined with upheavals in the Dutch Republic, the Iberian Peninsula, Russia and the Ottoman Empire and be seen as one global crisis in which a sudden drop in global temperatures created famine and helped to fuel parallel political conflicts and deadly war around the early modern world. Parker's work helps to show that there were transformations in this time period that affected large swathes of the world. And in any case, perhaps we simply need somehow to divide the past up into time periods, if only for practical reasons. For instance, to help ensure that a module like this one gives equal space to discussions of the distant, middle distant and more recent past, or to help us to organise our conversations as historians. But you've also seen in this second part of the lecture that there are groups and civilizations from around the world whose histories do not easily fit into a box bearing that broadly Eurocentric label of early modern. Many of the changes that we identify as marking some type of transition from the Middle Ages to the early modern period, from the early modern to the fully modern, fit best when applied to English or European history, and yet were often, not always, but often, unknown or, in some cases, irrelevant across vast other areas of the globe. At the very least, that represents a problem, a problem worth noticing on a module like this, that introduces you at once to historical periods under those broad headings of ancient, medieval, early modern and modern, and also introduces you to something that we are calling world history.